I was working with paramedics and we got to talking and I asked one of them what the most difficult part of the job was and his answer was, it's the kids. And he told me a story about a call that he had responded to about a 13 year old boy that had been pretty badly, severely hurt. And he picked the boy up, they picked the boy up from the home and the boy's father had beaten him pretty severely and as they were transporting him to the hospital, he said to the boy, what, what happened, why did your father do this? And the boy said, it's Tuesday. And that was it. It can be anything, it doesn't matter what it is. You'd never know what you're walking into. There is no predictability and it just becomes part of everyday life. And if something becomes part of everyday life like that, it just changes the way that you, that you view the world and you no longer necessarily even think of it as a traumatic event. It's just life. So part of our challenge is to help people see that there can be a different life. I don't understand what you were thinking. Tell me exactly what happened. Nothing. Nothing? Doesn't look like nothing. You know I have to submit a report to the judge. Who are you texting? Texting a friend. What do you care? Let me see your phone. I'm not gonna let you see my phone. It's my phone. I don't want to violate you, Manny, but... This doesn't look good. What were you thinking? Yo, Mario, what's up? Come here. Hey, man, why don't you leave her alone? I was thinking. I gotta do something. Well, you sure did something. A lot of times you throw up in really in two different worlds simultaneously. One world in which there are rules and laws that govern behavior and what you should and shouldn't do. But then they grow up in another world where there is violence in the home and violence on the street. And that's just the way that things are and you have to toughen up. The challenge for them is negotiating when do you apply which set of rules. She doesn't want to talk to you, man. She doesn't want to talk to you. What are you going to do about it, huh? Oh, my God! No! No! Stop it! Stop it! You're man. No! Stop it! Stop it! Because oftentimes they grow up in these environments, they don't necessarily have a sense of other ways of being. I so badly want to say, oh, you need to stop drinking, you need to stop smoking, stop cutting, stop fighting. But we have to first back up a little bit and say, why? Why is this person doing what they're doing? Because on some level, what they're doing is working. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it. The purpose in creating this film was to initially provide education and support to providers across a range of different child serving settings, so including mental health, child welfare, juvenile justice, and school based settings and in providing this support so that providers could more fully understand how, com how trauma looks and how it can lead to these different complex reactions among youth and also to hopefully um, minimize that potential for misdiagnosis or mislabeling that may often occur. Um, secondly, we wanted to offer support to family members and caregivers in understanding how trauma can look and how it can look very complex and to really support them in advocating for um, their own needs and their own services for, for, for their youth or for themselves. Children and adolescents who have experienced chronic or multiple traumas beginning at an early age and often at the hands of their caregivers 
really often have a range of difficulties, a range of significant difficulties that cut across areas of functioning and impairment and across different diagnoses. And this is often referred to as complex trauma. Unfortunately, the challenge is that there is no one diagnosis to identify kids who have been complexly traumatized and who have complex trauma symptoms. Trauma doesn't just look like one thing, but it looks like a lot of different things, and it may lead to a range of different labels that are not connected to trauma. And so what this means is that a lot of the youth that are served often do receive multiple diagnoses. I, I think of trauma as the great imitator. The effects of trauma can look like depression, they can look like ADHD, they can look like bipolar disorder, in some cases they can even look like schizophrenia. We may see someone who comes in with depression and anxiety and panic attacks uh, and mood swings and some aggression and you could give each of those behaviors a different diagnosis or you could say what explains all of it and especially in children maybe all of those things are explained by a trauma history. So uh, the term complex trauma has been used to try to, to get a handle of this, that trauma is not just one simple little thing, it's not one diagnosis, but it can involve so many other things. It can involve uh, people's relationships, it can involve being aggressive, it can involve being very depressed, um, a whole bunch of different ways that are much larger than one particular diagnosis. What I often see in my work is that children who have experienced trauma um, are often misdiagnosed with um, an autism spectrum disorder, um, ADHD, and a lot of it has to do with um, the fact that sometimes uh, there isn't uh, a comprehensive enough history taken related to the child's experiences. Having experienced trauma uh, can also look like um, problems in development or behavioral problems. I think there is sometimes a, a, like a poor understanding of maybe the role of genetics. I mean, I think people um, might think that, well, because the parents were a certain way, maybe the child is headed that way. And it's more complicated than that. And, and, and the environment has a great deal to do with um, the presentation that you, you see in children. Part of our challenge is to look at these problematic or difficult behaviors as coping responses, really. They're representing the child's best effort at coping with a very difficult life circumstance. And in many ways, these responses are adaptive. So for example, if you take an adolescent that's grown up with a lot of community violence, he may physically assault a peer at school for threatening him or disrespecting him. And while doing that might get him suspended or kicked out or some sort of criminal consequence, he's also earned respect from his peers and he's also proven that you can't mess with him. So if you grow up in an environment where violence is the norm and it's just part of everyday life, you no longer start to think about that as, as unusual. So if somebody says to you, have you ever been physically abused? Well, no, I'm hit every day. I told you, I don't want my baby around anyone who's violent. It was just something stupid. I don't even know what happened. I would never hurt our baby. How am I supposed to trust you? Go clean yourself up. Give me some water, hurry up! Don't 
you four. Take one. All right. Without a trauma lens, the children in a classroom may appear that they're the most difficult children to teach. They have um, acting out behaviors or sometimes they're withdrawn or they're numb and they don't seem to benefit from the educational um, day that the teacher has prepared. I think it's a very frustrating situation for a teacher who comes to the profession wanting to teach, but if they don't understand behavior and they don't have the trauma lens, that can lead to um, a teacher that gets easily frustrated. Hey, bud. Seems like you've been having a hard time. Do you want to talk about why you've been getting in fights? Not getting along with the other kids in your class? Without that trauma lens, our school system is geared to labeling children for maybe a disability or maybe as incorrigible or disobedient and maybe oppositional behavior disorder, things that are really hard and that child should leave the campus and leave school or maybe get suspended or exp expelled. Um, but that dialogue is different with um, the trauma lens. You tend to find out what's happening, if the child is eating well, if they have shelter, if they have an adult at home that's taking care of them, because our children really do come with a lot of different issues into the school system. And they spend so many hours of the day at our school that schools can be really the, um, the area that really provides that safety for many of our children who don't have it at home or in their communities. Manny, wait up! You have to stay close. Also, I have heard that you've been having trouble paying attention. Focusing on your work? Would you be willing to tell me what's bothering you? The prevalence of having stressful life events is, is very much in, I think, every classroom. And the opportunity to understand that a child that um, is coming to school with an array of situations that need and warrant um, a teacher, an educator, an administrator, a school nurse, or a social worker, or anybody that's on the campus after school to understand that engaging that child in a way that's, um, that's helpful is, is really what it's called for. Manny, Manny! Hello, Manny! What's up, man? Working in the schools, to me, it's a miracle that they come to school. You know, we get stories sometimes um, where a family will show up with two, three, five children or their families and their cousins, and they just had a death the night before. And they're dealing with everything they have to deal with, um, something horrific, but they bring the children to school. And the children are coming to school, they're being taken to their classrooms, and they're saying, by the way, this is happening at home, our kids are at home, and this is what we have to deal with. How you doing? Where are you going, huh? Oh. Hey, that's my boy, Nick. Manny. Manny. Manny, you're not in trouble, okay? I just want to know what's going on. What's up? What the hell? Where you going, huh? Where you going? What's up? Oh my huh? For us, it's, it's really easy to say this child does not have the skills to be in, our, in this class or to be in the school or has broken all the rules. That tends to be the child that gets suspended or gets expelled. Trauma work means working with those kids that need us the most and many times that behavior is the difficult, um, challenging and sometimes they directly um, challenge our authority. So for us to really as adults and educators to look at that behavior and say, wow, what is he telling me or what is she trying to um, deal with? And to really find out what's beneath that behavior is the challenge because um, many times we're quick to make that phone call or call the parent and suspend and send them home when in fact they need to be in school. They need to learn those skills and they need to know that we care enough about them, that we want them to be successful, that we are going to teach them um, and help them adapt to the educational setting. I think the potential for misdiagnosing trauma or the effects of trauma as something else are quite large, especially with children and adolescents. One of the things about trauma, I think, is that the, the reactions to trauma fluctuate. One day a child might look 
very, very subdued and withdrawn and appear depressed or even developmentally delayed. And another day they might look out of control and hyperactive as though they had ADHD. Our biases as clinicians come into play here. So um, certain individuals may have more experience working with one diagnosis or another, may have more experience with children who have developmental problems, who have bipolar disorder. And so those biases may cause us to sort of see the thing that we're looking for. When people think about, when people hear the word trauma, they think about PTSD, but really it extends way beyond PTSD. And in fact, if you look at the research, about 70% of people that have experienced a traumatic event don't actually go on to develop PTSD. Many of them experience difficulties, you know, cognitive, behavioral, emotional, physical symptoms that extend beyond that. And a lot of those symptoms oftentimes are consistent with other diagnoses, including ADHD or bipolar disorder. So there can be some confusion. And what ends up happening is that a lot of these children are receiving multiple diagnoses. And in addition to multiple diagnoses, what often goes along with that are multiple treatments and multiple medications, each treating very disparate kinds of things. So when you look at the symptom picture, you're seeing lots of different symptoms, and so you start treating these different symptoms as if they're not related to one another. So you might be treating the bipolar, or you might be treating the borderline personality disorder, or the ADHD, and people aren't really looking at the entire clinical presentation through a trauma lens. I just, I don't know what's wrong with me. I get really angry sometimes and nothing can calm me down. And I've heard it all. I have conduct disorder. I have bipolar disorder. There's probably not much you can do to help me anyways. But people keep asking me what I'm going to do about it. And I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do about it because I can't get any help anywhere. And I've tried all the different meds. And the fact is that they just kind of numb me out, but it don't really help me get over anything. One thing that is quite common to see in, in children presenting for mental health treatment, especially if they have already been in treatment or in the system, is that they may be on one, two, three, sometimes four medications at the same time. The psychiatrists and the pediatricians treating these children are trying to help them. And so when one thing doesn't work, they try something else and they add another medication. And so they sort of, there's an accumulation of attempts trying to figure out what can we do to help this young person. And so as children go into adolescence, this problem is exacerbated. As they get older, they've seen more and more different clinicians and possibly more medications have been added. One of the things that I like to think about in practice is if someone comes in on several medications, that begs the question, why are they on them? And perhaps they're not working. And if they're not working, that may be because we are not treating the right thing. And we need to take a step back and sort of widen our lens and, and say, maybe if we take some of these medications away, we can try to figure out what is actually going on. Certainly for families, for parents, it might be much easier to think that, that your child has a, has a biological illness rather than that, that your child has been exposed to things um, that are so disturbing and so profoundly affect every aspect of children's lives. For parents, that's that's not easy. When we see kids with multiple diagnoses, depending on the system that they're in, um, those diagnoses may be actually treated in isolation without the common threat of trauma. Oftentimes these youth move in and out of systems because of the different diagnoses and labels that they receive. So for instance, we may see youth having aggression, having substance use, having uh, problems with oppositionality, and those in and of themselves can have individual diagnoses and often lead to the labels of being a bad kid at school or being labeled as delinquent or ending up in um, special ed services when they may or may not need that for their academic or learning difficulties, ending up in the juvenile justice system. And so what often happens as these kids move in and out of these different systems systems and have these different labels, those labels get carried with them to the other system that they move to. And then the child themselves may actually have an understanding of themselves as being a bad kid, as being a 
troubled kid versus really having a true understanding of what may contribute to those difficulties. And I think that's oftentimes the fault of us not having a trauma-informed system of care across the board. Using a trauma lens helps us to be more effective in servicing the youth, where we used to, they come into the system, we say, okay, this is what the behavior is, this is where we're going with this. Now we peel the layers back, instead of focusing on just delinquency, really focusing on where the behavior is stemming from and what kind of services we can give to support that. So when we see certain behaviors in, in the youth that we're working with, our first question is, what happened? Instead of just dealing with the behavior as it is, we really want to know what's causing that behavior because there are some other issues that may be going on that we're really not addressing. So I think that it's important to have that frame of mind when we're dealing with our youth. We tend to want to fix things and we can't fix anything unless we really know where to start and what's happening. So sometimes we think we know what's best for them when they actually, they have an idea of what they need as well and what's best for them. And so opening that communication with them, talking to them, building that trust, building that relationship with them, that helps us to be more effective with them. If that trauma lens is not used, that can often lead to services that are either ineffective or inappropriate or potentially detrimental. Because if providers are not connecting the dots themselves about how all of these different potential diagnoses or potential different labels may be related to trauma, then the youth and the caregivers and family members are not seeing that connection as well. Look. I know you love your kid, and that's a beautiful thing. But you have to start working on making better choices if you want to keep on being the man of your house, and that's real talk. We tend to see the greatest difficulty in transitioning our youth back to the care providers when they're in our system because they don't feel supported or they don't feel like they have the tools and the resources to address the behaviors that they're seeing. So I think it's really important to provide that support to the caregivers and the providers so that we can work together. There's only so much that we can do, but our goal is to transition our youth to a stable environment with their care providers. Approaching it from a trauma-informed lens, we will never view a case the same. I'm just gonna screw up like I have my whole life. Maybe you will, and maybe you won't but you owe it to your son to try. He's going to be your age one day. And what do you want him to think when he looks back and remembers his dad? As to what makes someone in, in my role, trauma-informed, um, I would say that it's to always have in the back of your head a question about, has there been trauma in this scenario? Is there something that I overlooked? And to never stop asking, not on the first assessment, the fourth assessment, the fifth assessment. Sometimes what can happen is that somebody writes down in, in a chart no history of trauma, there's no history of violence, there's no history of sexual abuse. And the next person who comes along sees that in the chart and says, oh, I don't need to ask this question. It's already been asked. So to, to never stop being curious and to never stop um, trying to really understand whatever the, the, the story is um, behind the people that we see in treatment. 
a lot of clinicians are, are just uncomfortable um, inquiring about trauma experiences because it gets into um, asking very difficult questions uh, or they might be mis mistakenly think that they're going to do more damage if they ask questions related to trauma or trauma experiences or, so, or sometimes they just minimize the impact that trauma can have on a child's development. If trauma goes unassessed and if the services that are provided are not trauma-informed and if family members and caregivers are not getting feedback on um, how the assessment process went, what the value was, then we're actually doing a disservice to them. So I think the more that we really not only engage our, um, our providers, other professionals as partners, but the more that we engage our youth in the process of providing good trauma-informed services, the more that we engage our caregivers in that process, the more effective our services will be and the more meaningful that they will be in the long run. Whenever we go into assessing, you always want to broaden your perspective and consider other options. If you don't ask that one important question, why? Why is this child inattentive? Why is this child having difficulty with his peers? Why is he blowing up at people? Then you don't, you don't know. It's entirely possible that he does have ADHD and he does have bipolar, or maybe it's purely a trauma response. When a child grows up in a house like you did, oftentimes they come up with ways of dealing with things to help them survive and cope with all that's happened before. I want us to understand together the connections between your behaviors and reactions, the difficult things you've lived through, and why you may be behaving and acting in these ways. If it's okay with you, I want us to work together to see what we're gonna do about this. It's really important to really take a step back as we think about our role and really simply translate that back to a child, back to an adolescent, because that can have such a profound effect um, in letting them know that this is totally normal based on what you've gone through. It's not just about having a supportive therapist, it's about really finding strength, finding support in their community, within their family context as much as we can, because that really is what's gonna sustain them on their path to recovery. You gotta think about your life, Manny. Think about all the good things you accomplished. Just work on making a better life. For our son. I love you. It's about giving them a different perspective. And then it's not just that different perspective, but then that hope that that's attainable for them. Because even if they have that perspective sometimes, they'll say, oh, but that's for other people. That can never be for me. And when that happens, I think that the you know, my job as a clinician is to give them that hope and hold that hope for them that it might be possible.